I actually find it strange that during our current day and age that people find it fascinating that so many black people are tattooing and getting tattooed. They think it's quite new in our culture when in fact it's one of the most ancient uh, parts of what we've always done. Black people have always marked their bodies to associate themselves with their tribes and their gods. These markings had to do with life, death, uh, rites of passage, and it's who we are, and uh, it always has been who we are, and these new black tattooists are reaching into the past and bringing this uh, into our current future. This isn't something new with black people. This is part of who we are and who we've always been. And uh, I have no problem with stating that many other cultures have learned from what we have done in our culture. And uh, unfortunately, so many times it has been stolen from us and uh, actually acquired and been represented in other cultures as theirs, when in fact it came out of the roots of who we were. Man, I'd say the first thing I could probably say about being being black, being an artist of color, period, just in the tattoo industry in the 80s, there was no black tattoo artists. When I first started tattooing, it was pretty rough. Um, being a black tattooist, I couldn't find an apprenticeship. No one would teach me. And I actually got laughed at when I walked into certain shops here in of all places, Southern California. I'm not talking about the Deep South. And you know, I'd never been into a tattoo studio, didn't know what to expect. I just knew I wanted to be a tattoo artist. So it was kind of vague on information on how to get a job as a tattoo, tattoo artist. So you just kind of had to just wing it. It wasn't common. I kind of tried to read up on it as best as I could, but there's only with so much information we were allowed at the time. So, you know, I gave it a shot one day and I almost didn't like it. <laughs> For a little while, I was like, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know about this, you know? But for me, I just knew that this was something that I really wanted to get into. So when I, the first thing that I've learned about tattooing was from reading stories about Jackie. And that once she had this, this, this time she was in front of her shop. She walked into her shop to unlock the door and a, a, a white woman was standing outside of her shop. And this girl said, this white girl said, I was standing at my door and she said, nigga, get out the way. I said, well, let me tell you, you don't have to be in this nigga's shop. Get the fuck out. Okay, my name is Jackie Gresham. I've tattooed at this shop for 35 years. I started off in uh, Detroit. So actually, I've been tattooing around... Uh, 38, 40 years, something like that. I've been around tattooing quite some time. What drew me to New Orleans? Uh, at that time, I believe there was only one tattoo shop here. What made me want a tattoo? Because it's fun. <laughs> Am I right? Someone, I can't remember who it was, uh, mentioned, did you know that there was a black lady in uh, New Orleans who tattooed? And uh, it gave me some hope, even though I didn't know her and I didn't know of her work well. It was just nice to hear that you weren't alone in this struggle. To be honest with you, me tattooing is just a sheer accident. Uh, I was training to go to be an architect and uh, we came down here and, and the, the, Ollie taught me to tattoo an English, he was an English white guy, and he taught me to tattoo. And uh, it was just, New Orleans was a lot of fun. Everybody's real friendly down here, the climate's warm, you know, all that good stuff is how I came from Detroit to here. You know, so look, at, I was 29 years old, looking for a new place to go, you know. Uh, we couldn't get a job in the engineering field, so that's how I wound up tattooing.
92, the tattoo scene was really limited. At the time, you didn't really have a whole lot of choices in tattoo shops. You know, we had urban tri or, uh, we had body images in town, and then you had Painless Paul out in Decatur, who had Ace Tattoo, and I think you had um, George Electric Dragon out on Buford Highway. It was really about it. There was hardly anybody here. We didn't really see any other shops open up until Gary Yoxon left body images and opened up Tornado Tattoo in Little Five Points. And that was the first shop in Little Five. And a lot of other shops just kind of sprang out of that, you know? You know, and then Tony Olivas came to town. You know, eventually we all split off and, you know, out of all that, Shea opened up Liberty Tattoo and then I was with Shea for a long time. I opened up here. And also during that time, Cap came to town after, or during all that, Cap Sumsky came to town, opened up Timeless. And, I'd be hard pressed to tell you what year it is. I'm really bad with dates. Um, you know, I remember hearing about West End Tattoo. That's the first time I heard of you know black tattooers in Atlanta. And uh, see, so at West End, and you had like uh, Superman over there. I can't remember who else was there at the time. Um, I started hearing about Julia. Started that place. Hi, I'm Julia, and uh, I've been tattooing on and off since 1968. Um, I am the original owner of West End Tattoo. Uh, when I opened West End, it was, it was kind of scary. I had no idea what kind of reception I was going to get from either the white community that felt pretty much I was a traitor, or the black community who felt pretty much I was an outsider. Remember a guy named Red, who still, doesn't Red own West End? Yeah, man. yeah so Red's still around. Um, talked to him on occasion. Nobody listens to Crow Base anymore. Dubstep now. <laughs> this is all new jazz. Nobody listens to new jazz anymore. It's all dubstep. Which not like dubstep. Hip fiber. <laughs> Unopened. Fresh. My name is Tyrone Cooling. Everybody calls me Red. And I uh, was uh, introduced to uh, Foot and Julie Alfonso at West End Tattoo. And uh, worked there for three years. And uh, uh, Miss Alfonso decided that she wanted to get out of the business in 2000. And um, I bought the business and I've had it ever since. Back then, when, you know, last freak neg, city's crazy. And I come to the West End, and this is clearly a black neighborhood, black part of town. There's this white lady doing tattoos. She was the only tattoo shop in the West End. And from what I remember, there wasn't, you had to go, it was downtown, West End, Greenbrier. And that was it. You know, as a black person, like when I first got down here and tried to get a job in the shop, you know, everybody told me the same thing when I went around. I went to Cap. Uh, he was very gracious. I went to Phil at Urban Tribe. He was very gracious. 
I went to uh, Ace Tattoo, uh, Paul, uh, Painless Paul, all very gracious. They all said the same thing. Looks looks like you know what you're doing. You got solid line work, solid shading, solid color, but I just, you know, don't, I can't use you. Go to West End. They all said the same thing. Go to West End. They'll go, you need to go talk to Julie. They all pointed me out to Julie. You gotta go see Julie. She'll hire you. And turns out they were all right. And if she wasn't in the West End, hiring, you know, talented black people, I mean, there would have, you know, of course there would be no West End, but a lot of us would have never even got into it. I'd always told the kids, you guys are the first, you are the first black tattooers. You have to do it right. You can't do it like that. You, <laughs> no mistakes in West End. It's got to be on the money. And I was on the kids all the time, you know, which they didn't really understand. It was like, man, cut me some slack, woman. First thing she asked me was, she said, can you do a freehand name? And I was like, I, I, no, I can trace one pretty good. And, you know, I get some, you know, she's like, no. Mm-mm. When I first came down to Georgia, I worked in a very busy local shop. Uh, it was a white-owned shop, and there was a tremendous amount of racism in there. And uh, they were doing these little bitty names on dark ladies. And you couldn't see these little bitty names on dark ladies. But to put an appropriate design on a dark person, that design has to be large. It has to have space between the lines. It has to be thick, bold. It has to suit that person. So the West End name was born. Fuck a pen, fuck a skin marker, take a toothpick, it's disposable, it's quick, it's easy, draw it on there, make it look nice. Draw Lazy S, draw her name on her, she looks at it, does she like it? If she doesn't? Throw a little heart in there with the little swirls, cause the ladies like that, make it big. So people come get a $25 name tattoo, like this fucking big. She said, if you can't draw it in three minutes or less, you're useless. But she had the mindset, she had the business mindset. We get them in, we get them out. Just say it, just say it, I'm saying it, I'm saying it. In the end, West End employed three homeless men I don't know, I think six, six other kids. And the thing was, you had to be black. You had to be able to draw. You had to be drug free. And you had to want a job. Our customers were, it was home. They would bring in their children. They would put blankets on the floor. They would move the chairs out of the way. The music would go on. They'd bring food. It was a party. And it really was a very wonderful, very magical place. And can y'all turn this track up, please? On it, swag. Hey, my nigga too is on it, swag. Hey, check me out now. Smoking on that super duper paper, rolling paper, blowing and trapping bad bitches. They be know it, they be know it, two piece that nigga. I ain't bragging, I ain't bragging, hope you think it's highly at yourself, it's highly, I'll be, I'll be, oh. Tukey, how do you explain Tukey? He was gullible. He was gullible. Uh, Maya Bailey came into work. I hired Maya first. And Maya Bailey came in and he has this tall, incredibly skinny kid with him. His name is Tukey, Tukey Carter. And Tukey comes up and he said he wanted to work there too. And I looked at him and he had this little angel face. 
and I knew he was innocent and naive and gullible and I am the most horrible practitioner of practical jokes. Julia asked me if I can draw, I was all cocky and shit. Like, yeah, I can draw, I can do this shit. Uh, pretty damn good, you know. Get a pencil and a piece of paper. Show me what you can do. And inside, I'm crumbling. <laughs> I think he's magnificent. So she had me draw this dragon and I was comfortable with drawing it, so I drew it. And he looked at me and he said, my skills are at a pretty good level. She was like, yo, this is a piece of shit. Don't ever tell me that you can fucking draw. Don't you ever es overestimate yourself to me again. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, what can I do to get better? <laughs> I was like, damn, what can I do? I thought I lost it then. I was like, fuck. And I'm going, oh, no, no, no. Just practice, kid, just practice. You know, and I'm doing stick figures compared to Maya and Tuki. You know, I can't draw worth beans. I'm Tuki Carter, and we're in Amsterdam. Out here by some dock, I guess, with a bag of weed in my hand breaking some shit up. That was the police that just rolled by too. It was fresh and the weed just out. But uh, I'm a artist and I'm an artist of every facet of art. And what else I gotta say? <laughs> I say, man, be like me. Uh, speak on Tuki Carter. Uh, Tuki's a, he's an interesting dude. Tuki Carter is a a real interesting dude, a rock star. Like the Rick James of like nigger tattooing, you know what I'm saying? You're like, yeah, he's a super funky, yeah. He's funkadelic, yeah. I've worked alongside Tuki for many, many, many years, many, many years, and learned a lot from him. Anything he seems to want to do, he does well, you know what I'm saying? And that is exceptional. They don't make guys like that no more, like really, you know? Most tattoo artists didn't even see us as artists or tattoo artists because we did names. They was like, yo, are you talking about the name shop? <laughs> so I started learning the lingo. It was like, uh, we basically scratchers, because all we did was names. Uh, all we was was black. But, you know, at that time, it was a little harder to be accepted in the tattoo community, because the only thing we did was names, small roses, peaches, and hearts. We, all the colors we had, we were using them on uh, light skin. And the reason was just the basic colors. It was red, green, it was black, red, green, Sometimes yellow. I ain't seen no turquoise. I ain't seen no fuchsia, no pinks, no. We had magenta, and that was a dynamic color. But it wasn't really like nothing serious going on because we was, like I said, we was trying to color in the best peach or the best rose. Flowers and shit like that. I, was, I wasn't trying to do that. I was trying to color in some you know, comic book looking ass shit. I don't know what the hell I was trying to do. But I was trying to learn. I do know that. And the colors that I was seeing in these magazines, I was trying them on people. I started buying more colors. I started using them on brown skin. I was just testing shit out. Like, you know what? Let me see if I have it. I put some yellow here. I put some turquoise on this motherfucker right here. I had people come back with that shit fucked up. Like, nah, it's, I'm like, shit. Let's fix this shit. Julia was taught us how to tattoo. She was like, don't you use them colors. Don't you do that. Don't put no black shade in with that rose. You color that rose in solid red, don't you? Don't. You were doing putting yellow in there. I'm like, you know, I've seen it. I was at the convention. She was like, don't listen to none of that shit in the convention. Don't copy shit you see in the magazine. I'll never forget it. I did the total opposite. I was copying everything I was doing in the magazine and the magazines, and I was doing everything I saw at the convention. I seen Joe Capbianco was the first dude I seen draw with a Sharpie. He drew a yellow Sharpie, and he came back in with orange. He came in with green, tightened everything up. 
And he did the outline. I was watching him do the whole coloring, seeing him dipping his colors, being nosy. I was ear hustling. I was doing all type of shit, like to learn how to do this color. I was going through a whole bunch of shit to do the color. I wasn't just popping this shit out. You know, she was basically trying to protect us from doing some shit and getting thrown out there under the bus and people are, you know, talking about us like they already were. We was like the worst, we was getting the worst shit. They can't do shit but names. I don't even know how they ain't doing nothing but names. We even had that. I, I even ran into black, a lot of black people. Like, I don't let no niggas touch you, me. Um, Cause it really, I don't know, it ain't, ain't really no style of tattooing. People say I have a style, I don't see my style of tattooing cause I do so much shit. Whatever I see that I like, I'ma try it. If I see I like, I'ma try it. I don't know if you call it biting, I don't know if you, I don't know what you call it. It's an influence. I'm influenced by a lot of people and a lot of art styles. <laughs> Back then, when I got into tattoos, like most of the time, things were not colorful. Most of the time, you were using um, two colors, three mat. Things were real simple. It was like a lick 'em, stick 'em job. You know what I'm saying? And uh, most of the time, people they just wanted a mark, and basically, they got it. My name is Damon Conklin, uh, proud owner of Super Genius Tattoo. Uh, founder and host of the Seattle Tattoo Convention, which just had its 10th year. Been tattooing for about 16 years or more, and uh, I like to paint a lot. <laughs> Definitely the early 90s was a huge art explosion, and they called it New School after a time, but it really all it was was just a new generation of artists. Previous to that, you know, there's, there's always been a lot of biker stuff, and that's what kind of most of us have seen growing up, or most of us that are in our age range. But, uh, but even before our time, Ed Hardy was bringing over like Japanese designs and other artists were doing this too. I would say one of the most influential tattoos on myself and my career is a man named Leo Zulueta. I tattooed with him for uh, an early part of my career. And he was known as pretty much the godfather of tribal tattooing. You didn't see that type of tattooing in the United States until he brought it. If you were to ask uh, what my signature uh, style of tattooing is, it's a twofold thing. Originally, people came to me for tribal tattooing, well, what's known as neo-tribal. It's based on the designs out of Borneo, and it's the long spiked type of heavy black tattooing that you see a lot of people getting. Uh, that I learned from Leo and have traveled around the world and picked up some different styles based on that. Uh, secondly is a really colorful style and a very almost a graphic design style that's crossed with a bit of a Renaissance style that's heavy in color and uh, a lot of really rich design work. As far as subject matter, it's whatever. It's across, it's, uh, it's up and down across the board from religious to Afrocentric to even traditional lately. A funny story, when we opened up Vantage Point, <clears throat> before we came up with the name Vantage Point, we were gonna name it No Names. And was literally yeah. not gonna do a motherfucking name on any damn body. Didn't care, because I hated it. You know, it bothers me that people come in and they get uh, Japanese writing on them. I don't relate to that. Half the time I ain't read it. You can't read it. They can't read it. Why you want a Chinese symbol? There's so much amazing art comes out of Africa. At the Shrine of the Black Madonna, they showed me a book of Adinkra symbols. And they were wonderful. They were these great little graphic symbols taken from funeral cloth from the Akan peoples. Fantasy. More fantasy. You know what I'm saying? Like for any subject you could bring in for you, like I made to like I can interpret your best fantasies, you know? It's this and that, I got, a, I got a like, you know, a style that I can relate to whatever you bring. So if you bring me something Japanese work, boom, I got it. Got a style for that, it's my style. If you bring me something more like biomechanical, I got a style for that, but it's my style. Then I got the skull style, that's my style. That's only my style, and, and but just everything kind of has my signature on it. And when you get to see it, it's, it has my, like, face on it. It's Geno style, you know? What I feel the young artist can bring? It's kind of like what me and, and, and Gino doing here all day. It's like battle of the young versus old in here. You know what I'm saying? Like he'll put me on the old music and I'll put him on the new music. 
So he'll put me on the old techniques and I'll put him on the new techniques that I, you know what I'm saying, might have discovered on my own. Uh, I, if I could tattoo every day, just the um, neo-traditional style, just because it's just free, man, and you can just really do some really crazy shit. I like doing crazy tattoos, it's just fun. Like people who just balls out, just don't give a fuck, willing to get a bat head or some shit on them and live with that, that takes a lot of guts to me, so I commend those people. I want to tattoo those people, because I'm that type of person, like, I get some crazy shit like that on me just because it's dope, it's a dope piece of art. I don't feel that it's harder for me to be a female tattoo artist, especially because there's so many awesome female tattoo artists. I feel your artwork speaks for itself, whether you're a man or a woman. If your artwork is dope, then it doesn't really matter. I'm drawn to more neo-traditional styles. I definitely would like my own personal style to develop more in a direction that combines neo-traditionalism as well as whatever else that I feel like invoking in it. When it comes to doing black clientele, doing bigger work is always more effective. You know, you could do bigger positive and negative spaces, which from a distance is easier for the eye to pick up and catch. You know what I'm saying? And so you don't have to, uh, you don't, you, you don't have to strain your eyes so much on having to see the different uh, movement and, and pieces that, that, you know, like some of the, the bigger details, some of the smaller fine art details that are on the piece. I got this thing where. I don't do no human head this smaller than a fist on a black person. It doesn't make sense. And if it does have to go smaller, it has to be just like one of those kind of silhouettes where everything here is black and you basically don't see nothing, just the dark under the nose, dark lip, one lip shining, and that's it. Contrast is very important. Black and gray is easily like my most favorite. And it's because like you can just be so subtle with it. The shading. Shading, I feel shading makes a tattoo. Everyone could do a line, but not everyone could make a line with shading. Like using shading is for shapes. You know, it's easy to draw, do an outline. Anyone, you give them a stencil, there's a lot of outline stencil artists, but shading, like that's where you get creative. And having somebody say that, you know, the portrait looks like a photograph on their skin, like, that's some fulfilling shit. And so it's something that I'm happy that I can bring to all my customers to ask for it. Um, black people don't really think they can get all those shades of gray and get these really like three-dimensional uh, portraits because their skin's not light. And I like actually proving that theory wrong. Clean lines and tattooing, I think is like the first thing that somebody should learn. You know, the first time I picked up a tattoo machine, you know, it almost rattled out of my hand. And I was like, man, I'm about to have to think of another profession. I mean, primarily to be a good artist, to me, you gotta have some straight lines. Because it can be a great piece, and if the lines ain't straight, it really don't count to me. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, nothing, it, it'll disqualify you. I guess I could just explain it as a million and one plus more lines. Um, I like a lot of lines. I'm a female. I like a lot of fine, uh, fine detail. Most artists will dumb down a lot of the lines and put in the shading and make it look really, really full that way. I like to work the opposite way. I like to dumb down the shading and have a lot of lines and have that shading complement the lines as opposed to the other way around. Black female tattoo artists, they have, I think, the most potential out of every tattooing person in this world. Like, we always had the most potential. Like, we put our hearts into everything we do, whether it's raising our kids, whether it's building a family, whether it's work. It's like, we are the foundation, and we can become the foundation of tattooing. It's about how graceful we can tattoo, how our lives can just flow with the body. Like, not a lot of people can do that. It's like guys think of the hard, structured tattoos. Women bring out that soft side that needs to be done. Now, we're not, we're not soft all the time, but like our style, even if it's something like big and bold and graphic, it still has that twist to it that a man can't get. I do like to draw, draw my work on, like a marker prior to the tattoo, as opposed to stencils. Drawing actually on them, like you change the curves, it works well, flows. It doesn't make the tattoo look so flat.
the honest truth is 90% of white tattooers do not take the time or the effort to figure out how to tattoo dark skin. I've had the opportunity to tattoo every skin type and every ethnic group and uh, you know it's everybody's different and you have to uh, kind of tailor your approach to the person that you're tattooing. When I first started tattooing about a year into it I did a design on a really dark skinned guy. I took it right off the wall he picked it out. The first tattoo this is a funny story actually you'll like this. The first tattoo okay because at this point, I had already been in a couple of magazines, and I thought I was hot shit, right? I come in, and I'm tattooing in New Orleans um, for Annette LaRue. I do my first tattoo sitting there. It's script, of course. What else would it be? I did it with a three, which is what you would use on white people, by the way, <laughs> back then. I got fired. I got fired within the first, like, eight minutes. She fired me. He's like, no, 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 get your shit and get the fuck out of here. And I'm like, what, 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 you know? But she was right when it healed up. You couldn't even, you know what I mean? Where, where did it go? When I got done with it, I couldn't even see what it was. And it was, a, it was a failure, you know? And I felt like, man, I really just kind of screwed this guy. Let's not mince words. It is totally fucking different tattooing black skin than it is white skin. And that's why you see so many fucked up tattoos on black skin. Because if I sit down and do the exact same shit with the exact same needle groupings on you that I do on me, it's not gonna look the same. Whether it's black or white artists, they put way too much detail in there. Uh, you've seen the Judy Parker art is a good example. And Judy, whenever I do her stuff, I, uh, I have to take out half the lines because it's so detailed and so fine and so intricate. But you can see that on my Ed Hardy piece, which Ed did, uh, look at it now. It was just too much detail in a small amount of space. If I'm gonna tattoo dark skin, the first thing I'm gonna do is adjust the composition right off the bat. In other words, um, I'm not gonna put a whole bunch of little gay detail all piled on top of itself in the way that a lot of white people would want me to. I'm gonna simplify, zoom in on the most significant, which by the way, is a lot of what you see in our style that we do on white folks, which is, I got this from tattooing black people. So a lot of the stuff that I'm known for that is our style of work is over-exaggerated imagery, zoomed in, hyper-focused, and simplified with gigantic loads of contrast. Where the fuck did I come up with that from? I came up from that from tattooing black skin. Because if you then apply that back on the white skin, imagine what happens. It's fucking brilliant. It screams like it'll blind children from across the parking lot. Anytime I've had to approach the design with dark skin, it's always going to be real simple, you know, as straightforward as I can make it. I'm not going to necessarily pack the full range of colors into it. So I'm going to try to keep it open and simple, a nice readable silhouette not really water it down with too much fluff and icing. Just try to do the tattoo the straight way. Thank you. I think a lot of um, white tattooers think that they can't get good photos on dark skin. Um, so they, they maybe aren't gonna try to push their custom, like their, you know, their style on a darker skinned person, they're gonna think it's, it's kinda, it's not gonna end up in my portfolio because I'm not gonna be able to get a good photo of it. You know, it's the clients too. If they don't come to us with a creative idea that, you know, gets our, gets us excited about the idea, then, you know, you're gonna get a good tattoo, but you're not gonna get one that's just like loaded up with everything that I might have to offer. Hey, DD, what? give us a cigarette. I never. You gotta have his brothers in the train. <gasps> that is grown. I gotta rub this one for the game because y'all shit raspberry and nut. For real, it looks like, look like strawberries. You gotta let it rub it in. <coughs> Two strawberries. Reggie, you gotta help him, Reggie. Oh, Lord. 
No. Mm. Yes, he did. <laughs> right now on TV, a lot of athletes and rappers are quote unquote tatted up and they have that look. A lot of people want to have that look. So you have so many scratches out here because it's in such a demand. Given a recession or whatever, people are going to always be broke and cheap. So there's a very high demand for tattoos to look tatted up, to have tattoos everywhere, good or bad. So you got a lot of scratches out here. I mean, a lot of them. Everybody picks up a tattoo machine and just start cutting. I mean, I guess it's like the ne the word is a scratching somebody who just scratches on you. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what else to say about that. Scratcher don't sound too good to me. Someone who just does tattoos out of their house or something like that. I would believe it's someone that's just try trying to make some money. If I heard somebody say, oh yeah, I'm about to go to my scratcher today, I'm like, okay. And close to jail tax, but they do them in the hood, in their yard, in their backyard, you know what I'm saying? Was I aware that your people do tattoos in kitchens? Yes, I was. Do I look at that and be like, that's some weakness? Yes, I think it looks really lame. But I just thought that was just a natural path that they all take, so I wasn't consciously aware of the fact that, oh no, that's, that's like the lowest of the low. I used to come when I was a, a kid, kind of get away from the, uh, from the city, man. Get away from the hood. And just really being around the nature and everything, kind of always really was a big inspiration for my art growing up. You know, with the colors and schemes, especially during fall time when you see the purples and you see the, the oranges and yellows. I, that's into this day, you see that, um, that's showing my artwork in a, in a color pattern. I, I use it in my tattoos and my pans. But this is, this is the closest thing I could, when I was in Asheville growing up, this is the closest thing I probably could see to God, you know? A lot of people was going to church. I wasn't really big on only going in, in the churches and stuff like that, so I think this was kind of my way of uh, worshiping the God, uh, uh, showing my homage and respect to the Most High. This is 
This is like my sanctuary of, of peace. <laughs> you know, they would never let me sell dope. Nobody, I was too wild at the time. Like I was real wild. Like I was always known for carrying pistols. I was always getting into it with the police, man. Like I wasn't, like I was a little, I guess people say I had the little guy, you know, complex, man. I was like Napoleon, I guess, you know, like I proved myself. Like I heard stories about my dad. Like my dad didn't take no mess from nobody. Put that thing on him. <laughs> Put that thing, and that's right. Yeah. Put that thing on him. Put something on that honey. <laughs> Put something on that honey. You know my word. That's what I say. Put something on that honey. You got to put something on that honey. And then, you know, and then they, they, and they'd be more skeptical next time to say, okay, well, I better not do this right here because I know the consequences. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the consequences. Neg call, not call it, nice. You know what they call it? Negative reinforcement. I used to look out for dope boys, man, and I made sure that, you know, I was a shooter, straight out. No, everybody know me from that aspect of it. I used to be out here in these projects and, and, I would be the first one to start shooting, man, every time. Or I will be the first, you know, like, you know, that's what I was doing. I was just, you know, pre I guess angry, you know. We had a lot of anger built up. We were hanging around in, um, in, in Pisgah View apartments. We saw a lot of shit. We saw a lot of uh, uh, drug dealing, um, um, uh, racism in West Asheville, people calling us niggas, throwing cans at us when we walked to the store. Um, so a lot of anger started building up. I, I wanted to see, be, see my father, I guess, and I didn't get to see him as much as I wanted to. So, of course, out of everything, like, I mean, how are you supposed to express anger? And a lot of times I would express anger either in artwork or acting out. Probably at the age of two, I noticed that Maya had an artistic ability that was, you know, beyond any other child at his age. Maya could honestly draw a picture and you could make out uh, what it was. He would go into details. If someone wore glasses, he would have glasses on them. Uh, if he noticed a flaw in them, he would always put that flaw on his pictures. And so he, at, at age of two, Maya really um, started showing me that he had the ability. And I realized it, so I just kept him in a lot of crayons, uh, uh, books. He always wanted uh, paper and pencil. And so we just always just always supported him in that. The re the, what really introduced me to tattooing, what got inspired me, I, my dad had a tattoo on his arm, it had Logan on it, it had the word Logan. Man, I used to see that tattoo growing up, I thought it was the hardest shit in the planet, man. I just thought it was just hard, man. So I, of course I wanted a tattoo growing up, seeing my daddy with one. I thought it was dope. And so um, we had gotten some trouble in high school and had to send my boy Josh off the Job Corps. When he came back from Job Corps, he had a tattoo on his arm. He had 100%. I'm like, what the hell? I mean, he's like, 100% black man. I'm like, oh, that's dope. I thought it was the freshest thing in the world. He's like, how you doing? He showed me how to make a, do a homemade tattoo with a needle and thread. What I did is, um, you drink the soda, and of course you got the cap on it, so you got the cap, put that down, you fill it up with Indian ink, you get a needle, like a regular needle and thread needle. You get the needle, and you get the very tip of it, and you wrap up the top of it with a whole bunch of whole bunch of thread. So you got a little tip of it like this. So now now you got this little uh like look like a cotton ball on the tip of your needle. You dip it into the ink, that holds all the ink, that tip of it on there, then you just poke. Stretch the skin out really good and you just poke, 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 and all that ink in that in the thread, just hold it in and just boom boom dip and do it like that, like stippling. It was crazy man. You can actually look like I did lines in that thing but it's all just mini dots. Me thinking, I'm thinking hustle, some money. So I start poking, picking in the projects in Erskine, man, just doing, I was like 17, 18, whatever, picking, doing the, uh, homemade tattoos with needle and thread. Making some money doing it, but it was slow as hell, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, really slow. So I heard out here in West Asheville, it was this white dude um, doing tattoos, and he had a tattoo machine. And so what I did is I got a tattoo by him, and I know it could take me a while, because they still was a raggedy ass tattoo machine. And uh, I looked at him do this tattoo on my arm, and I studied how he built that machine. I looked at everything about it, remember how to do it, went home and built me one. <laughs> we used to sit here, and everybody's like, yo, let me do the tat, man. That's how I used to do my hustling. While the dope boys over here, me and a couple other dudes would sit out here. And he's like, I can get a tat. And we had to find somebody's apartment to go in here and tattoo in, man. We, I, my stuff would be in a book bag. I used to carry myself in a book bag. And somebody wanted a tat, I would come straight to them, come to the one of their apartments, man, and, uh, and tat them up. And that's what I used to say, right here. My man Ray, he hooked me up, man. 
and uh, some hustlers I knew, man, ended up buying, buying me my, uh, my first tattoo machine. And I never forget him for that, man. I, I was dope. I was dope in him, man. One of my dudes who hustled hooked me up with an autoclave, which I bought from Liquid Dragon. Liquid Dragon, the tattoo shop, was the first shop to really open up and, you know, kind of welcome me in. And so, um, and then uh, my man, Sean Shivers, he bought me an autoclave. And from there, the guy named uh, Rick Morgan, he bought me my first tattoo machine, my real tattoo machine. And I ended up going to Atlanta with it, man. I ended up meeting Tukey. And I started looking for an apprenticeship and ended up getting an apprenticeship at West End Tattoo with Julio Alfonso. Meeting up with Tuke kind of slowed me down a lot, man, because Tuke wasn't in the street shit. Like, you know, I was wilding out, man. Tuke was more in the girls, hip hop. He was break dancing at the time. He was an artist. Yo, man, we, you know, he was just like a kind of a break from what I was used to. So we kicked it good with him because it kind of stayed out of trouble, you know, because he wasn't a street cat like that. He had friends that was in the streets, but he wasn't a street type dude. So it was just like me hanging with him was like a relate, you know, relief. He kind of saved my life on that aspect. Different between a scratcher, tattooers, and a tattoo artist. I think really, I really, I think they all the same. It's just like a, it's just like a a, a a a worm, you know. It's just like it's it's like a little worm, you know. what I'm saying that cuddles into a cocoon. You know what I'm saying? Eventually, when it, when, it, when it emerges from the cocoon, it becomes a butterfly. You know what I'm saying? Every, and, it, and it grows wings and it flies away. Well, I, I think that a scratcher is the little worm. You know what I'm saying? If he want to stay at the bottom on the ground and, and crawl around on the ground so the other little insects eventually will eat them, which that's what happens is what we're doing now. We eat them. You know what I'm saying? Because we're grown. Now. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's like, They'll never get to the cocoon because they don't want to progress. You see what I'm saying? So the, the tattooist becomes the cocoon. You see what I'm saying? That's who the tattooist is. But the tattoo artist is the butterfly. You know what I'm saying? That emerged from the cocoon. So it's a stepping process, man. But you know, some people want to stay dormant. And some people want to fly. You know what I'm saying? I want to fly. You know, plus change colors. You know what I'm saying? And keep flying. You know what I'm saying? Probably evolve into something else. You know what I'm saying? and become something else, you know what I'm saying, greater than all what I was in the beginning, you know what I'm saying, but still at the same time with, 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 the, uh, with the image printed on the tattoo artist, professional master tattoo artist, that's what I'm, that's what I'm, I'm going for. But it's about um, black tattoo artists. This was Derek's first tattoo almost 16 years ago. I thought that should be my first tattoo, my son's name. He would always be in my life. It definitely wouldn't have been a guy or any dude that I was messing around with. I really think it's too big. Now that I'm 38 years old, it's way too big. In the corporate world, wearing a button-down shirt with a little V-neck, you see the tattoo, it's too big. It should have been a lot smaller, but again, I was his first. I let him do whatever he wanted to do. This tattoo took six hours. <laughs> Something that would take like probably 20 minutes now. But I let him experiment. I didn't know at the time that he had never did a tattoo before. He wants to redo it and cover over it. It's my first tattoo, it's his first tattoo. This is our first, so I leave it as is. Scratcher as well. Uh, to be respectful, we all scratched one time, you know? It's whether you can elevate from that level to, to, to make your scratchings into art and have people respect what you're doing that differentiates the two. If you want to sit down and jack people, all, jack people up all day and you know you're doing it, shame on you, you know? But 
You know, if you care about what you're doing, you're not going to want to maintain that level for too long. You know, there's no future in your front end. <laughs> well, I learned the art of tattooing from just, uh, it was a friend of mine who went to Florida and for the summertime, when we came back, learning how to do it, the, uh, the jailhouse tattoo, you know, jailhouse work, the needle thread, you know what I'm saying? So I was the only one that knew how to draw. So, <clears throat> you know, I had to steady hand, so I had to do the little prick, prick thing, you know what I'm saying? From there, I came to Atlanta, you know, got to turn around there, I had to go back home, which is Alabama. You know, I met, a, I met a white guy, you know, my cousin told me it was a white guy down the street tattooing, you know. So I went down there, you know, sat around with him a, f a few times. And shit, he said, you look like you're interested in this. I was like, yeah, I am, you know what I'm saying? So he showed me all the stencils. This is when I were, first learned about carbon paper, stenciling, and, you know, seeing different little artworks that he had, you know what I'm saying? I was fascinated by it, you know what I'm saying? So I stayed there a couple weeks before I left. I asked him to make me a machine. I still got that machine to this day. You know, he, he what he did, he cut the cord, told me to get me a 12-volt plug, tape it together, put it together, and use good tar strings, change them out. You know what I'm saying? Go get me a pack of goddamn big pins, make my tubes, and my, you know what I'm saying, the needle tubes. That's how I did it, stayed sterile that way. You know what I'm saying? Using some fucked up ink called Pelican. But not learning later on that Pelican is used for a good reason. You know what I'm saying? Portraits with realism, which is what I like to do now. It's a long road, a real long road. A lot of bullshit, a lot of stuff to cover within the paths. But you overcome those paths, you know, those, those obstacles, really. Ay, 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 that shit, motherfucker. Okay. Burn. I was living with my mom and my little sister up here for about four years. And then it was time for graduation. My mom, she was an alcoholic, so we didn't really get along that much. And she kept us away from my dad a lot. And around 12th grade year, it's time for me to graduate. We used to get into it a lot. My mom didn't come to my graduation, so I was like, I gotta go. So I came to Atlanta. My name is Paper Frank. I'm an apprentice at City Inc. Right now we're in West Asheville on Burton Street, a place I used to be all the time. Right now I'm an illustrator, a visual artist, and just starting tattoo artist. I was trained by Maya Bailey, who's also from Asheville, so that was pretty dope. Apprenticeship, it's, you're not gonna like it. it ain't, everything ain't easy. Tattooing is definitely not easy, and you'll think you can do it when you first start but you really can't. I feel like without apprenticeship, you're not gonna really get the gist of tattooing. You gotta, you gotta feel everything, you gotta go through everything. You gotta fuck shit up. You gonna fuck something up to get to where you wanna be. It's a long journey, man. Uh, this is Tony right here. He tell uh, everybody, Tony. Hey, everybody. Anyway, um, this is my actual first tattoo that I ever done in the West End. Uh, this is my apprentice piece. Actually, right after I did this, Tattoo, I think it was in 95, Six. 96. Yeah, 96, I did it. And uh, right after I did this, believe it or not, I got it. I was working. <laughs> I was working that same day I did that. And it was, you know. And you were supposed to do 14 free for your yeah, apprenticeship. Yeah, I was. And I did that first one. She remember that. 14, though. Yeah. Woo. 14 free tattoos I was supposed to do. But I did this one and it started working. I don't know why they put me. She, she, <laughs> I don't know why she put me to work after this. Cause then none of my apprentices could do that. <laughs> and didn't get a job. Yeah. Uh, tattoo lifestyle, especially in the beginning when you start apprenticing, is the key word is sacrifice, man. Cause you're gonna work long hours. You're not gonna get paid, and you just gotta be a do boy. I do admit, during my apprenticeship, I had an easy apprenticeship. It was not as labor intensive as it could have been. You're spending a lot of time learning and being a do-boy and just, they're just breaking down your whole morale and you're not seeing your friends. Everybody's your boss in the shop. I don't care how old you are. I don't care about none of it. I don't care how good you are. You still at the bottom of the totem until you doing what you need to do to pass everybody.
My name's uh, Randall Crowley. Everybody calls me Seven or known as Seven. Um, tattoo artist in Cincinnati, Ohio. Been tattooing about almost 10 years. Next month will be 10 years. Maria Chang is my first apprentice in my, it's, it's weird, just as new as she is to tattooing, is as new as I am to having an apprentice. So that is crazy because you don't know this person for real. And sometimes, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. A lot of people apprentice their friends, but sometimes your friends ain't artists. So you're like, okay, they have these young ways. I'm not gonna listen all the way. You might think they will, but no. So if I can do this, you're like, no, stop. Or when do we start tattooing? Um, after you sit around here and do paperwork for me for, for a little while and do some drawing and make sure that you into this and stick around and maybe you need to get tattooed, you know, and so I expect my apprentice to. I open up every day, stay till close, draw, scrub tubes when he doesn't have time to, uh, sweep, sweep outside, uh, mop, vacuum, definitely draw, always, always watch. I feel like um, even if you can't get an apprenticeship, the most important ways to learn how to tattoo is to watch how it's done. Like there's so much, there's so many books, there's just so much shit on YouTube, but nothing, nothing will ever compare to just seeing it done right in front of you. And um, also getting tattooed, getting tattooed is like also pertinent to the situation because you have to know what it's like being under the needle. I expect my apprentice to have that, that go get it about tattooing, you know, not, not like I don't want to do that or I'm too good to do this tattoo or nah, not, not yet. And maybe not ever, you know, eventually, yeah, you can shoot that stuff to the people who work for you. If you end up owning the business or the person you're teaching tattoo or somebody who's newer in the shop because they ain't got that clientele yet. So yeah, they need them little tattoos. But right now you need to do everything that you see, whether it's a name, whether it's a, a form piece, if you're able to do sleeves now, get the sleeve done too. And do every tattoo as if you was doing a masterpiece. Even if it's a little hard, take your time and make that stuff right. Scratches out there, really just uh, put your machine down and, and take your time. Like, I even started out as a scratcher tattooing outside my mom's house. And now, like, I'm tattooing in London, which is absolutely crazy. Booked in London. You know, and you never be doing that if you're a scratcher. You're going to stay in a neighborhood tattooing your homeboy. So really just take the time and develop your craft. Like, I don't know, it's like going to college all over again. Get that apprenticeship, get your feet wet. Like, it sucked because I, I went from making money and having a job to having an apprenticeship for, I don't know how long I didn't tat, six months to a year or something crazy. So it's all about sacrifices, but in the end, it's gonna be worth it. Certain people get tattoos for uh, certain reasons, man, but uh, out of the day, I have every reason in the world to feel a little pain. Twig Sparks, uh, down here in Orlando at Hart and Huntington Tattoo. That's where I tattoo right now. I've been here for like three months. Um, been an artist all my life, been tattooing for 11 years now. Uh, got married a few years back. My wife is Coco, got two kids, Isaiah Kingston and Adriana May. And um, like I said, man, just living the dream, doing my thing. Tattooing is something that is gonna be the best or worst investment you can probably make in your life. You know, if you make the wrong decision, it's gonna be the worst. If you make the right decision, it can enhance you to a point to where you become addicted to getting tattooed because you got good work. You know, it could change your life because I've seen people change their whole wardrobe around a tattoo. I've seen people change their whole wardrobe in a negative way around a tattoo because it was so bad that now they don't want to have nobody see it. You see what I'm saying? But I feel that the mentality a lot of times in the black community is still at a low level because you got cats like Lil Wayne and these rappers out here getting all these crap tattoos, you know what I mean? And these cats just want to get tattooed for the sake of getting tattooed. Now, you got the brother who come in with the SB Dunks, you know, the Gucci belt, Louis Vuitton jeans, got a rolly on, you know what I mean? And you tell him, oh yeah, I'm gonna need 350 for that. And they, whoa, what? What? I do do it for $60. And I'm like, I'm glad you'll do to do it for $60 because when I fix it for you, I'm gonna do it for $600. 
the quality is gonna be based on what you spent. You know, old timer always told me, you know, people get the tattoo that they deserve. When you see cats with dope work, best believe that dude is educated on what he needs to do and what artists he needs to do. The first thing he do is go, let me see your portfolio. A lot of these brothers come in, the first thing they wanna do is how much you charge for a tattoo? Which is the dumbest question in the world. Because I'm like, what do you mean what I charge for a tattoo? Do you walk into a restaurant and go, how much you charge for dinner? But it's still that education process that they're not hip to because they're going in the wrong direction. You see what I'm saying? They need to start understanding that this is minor surgery. I tell them, you think I'm expensive? Well, that's funny because when you went and bought that Gucci belt that, that is not even leather and you paid 375 for it, when she said 375 for it and treated you like a nigga up in the spot, you gave it to her and she got you the hell up out of there. You didn't negotiate not one time. Then you went to the club and three other dudes had that same belt on. And then after six months, when the hole started to rip on it because this ain't even real, you know what I mean? You went and bought you another one, you see? Go to the hospital and see what their prices look like. It's gonna be serious. Go to the Benz dealership, a car that you can't even keep for 10 years without it breaking. That's the live one right there. These are all machines you made? Uh, my buddy Clark made that one. I made that one. Burt Grimm, my homeboy Creeper. Original Creeper frame, Chris Stencil. Those are two motors I'm gonna use for a rotary. Yeah, this is why I just had started right before I left. But all this, man, is all done by gray, you know what I mean, and black, you know what I mean? So that way I get a shot of this one, then I go in and paint that one too. But all this is brush, man, you know what I mean? And I think that that right there really stepped everything up because I see a lot of cast paintings and they go in with a Sharpie, you know, once you start seeing that, you be like, yeah, that's cool, but it's a Sharpie, you know what I mean? Go in there with a brush, dog. You know, and when you start seeing cats do things with brushes, then you just see it. It just has that look, you know what I mean? Where you just like, oh, all right. That's how you doing it, dog. So like I said, all this stuff is just really been on a download since you see like 09. I just do it, outline it, and then I stop, go to the next one, outline it. So that way I want to start shooting it, getting it scanned. And then, then from there I start, you know, painting it and whatnot. So I can almost catalog it, you know? So that way I can go from here to a t-shirt, Instead of painting it to finish, and then I gotta get it separated yeah. and broke down, I'd rather just keep it at this level so that way I can use the line art for whatever I wanna use it for. You know what I mean? The cook oh, it's Doug. Oh. My name is Trevor Lightsey. People, Some people know me as Troubles. Uh, if you want some bullshit, don't come to me. I definitely feel the work I do breaks the stereotypes um, of what people expect from me that I should do. Even if even if even if I'm still do street, I'll, I'll still do a street tattoo or whatever. But I'm gonna do it in my style. I'm gonna do it better. You're gonna get some artwork. Um, for example, when I was at my shop, this dude came in. He wanted a pot with a hand making crack. I mean, that's a pretty stupid idea to me. But I mean, he didn't get it because he wanted to spend like ten dollars on it. But uh, if I would have done that. It would have, that shit would have looked official, you know. It would have been done in my style and a realistic hand and smoking bubbles and chopping up all that stuff. But you know, he didn't get it because he wanted the street shop prices, and that's not what I do. I'm Ferrari prices. I can scar you. I can fuck you up. You can get an ugly ass tattoo on you, you know. But I don't. And I've done. I've. I've. I've invested in myself in terms of even. You know, sitting under other people besides, you know, Red, who gave me my apprenticeship. I've sat under other artists, pick other artists' brains. At conventions, I've taken classes. Like, I've put time into this where, I mean, that equals money. Time equals money. So you need to pay me for that. I mean, people, a lot of people can't do what I do. It's crazy how I just got stuck my name out there, but really, I went to all the strip clubs. I figure like they always show their bodies off. This is the best way to market myself because if I can get to the strippers, I can get to their tippers, I can get to the people that come and everything. So I started going to male strip clubs, female strip clubs, and I hustled, like hustle, hustle. At my house, of course, I was a scratcher when I started off. And I would be up literally all day, 24 hours, and I had people sitting on my stairs, on my porch, on my couch, but I had to do what I had to do for my daughter because a certain circumstance her dad couldn't provide, so I had to provide for my family. So I don't have a big family like that, and 
my mom, she got the kind of mentality sometimes, like, I raised y'all, I did my job. So she hasn't been like the mom to just be like, oh, drop her off over here. If push come to shove, she's there. But my sister's been helping a lot. But it's hard because you watch your daughter grow up. She's seven now, and she's growing up so fast. And it's like you want to be there to capture every moment. And it's like sometimes you can't because you're really trying to, you know, brand yourself, put your name out there, and you're really just trying to be successful for her. You know, I'm trying to make it where if something happens to me today, she'd be good. And, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's real hard not seeing her. My name is Chris Mensa. I'm a 35-year-old tattoo artist, born and raised here, Washington, D.C. Uh, been tattooing for about 13, 14 years. Being a tattoo artist is a strain in a relationship. Um, your work scheduling is different. Uh, there's not always time to uh, take your lady out and, you know, go to a show because you may have appointments and, you know, I really, I really don't have a lot of time as, as far as me, for myself, as an individual, as a person. Um, personal time is far and few in between. Um, now I've been, uh, I get my kids on the weekends. I pick them up Friday, Friday evenings and drop them off at school on Monday mornings. Uh, so the kids have to get up at 6.30 to start to get to school. Out the door by 7.30. Come back in the house by maybe about 9, 10 o'clock. Um, if, you know, enough time to shit, shower, shave, uh, back out the door to the shop. I personally don't feel I'm properly compensated for the time I spend away from my kids. Um, partially, it's been my own doing. can't get those times back. Only thing I can do now is um, enjoy them when I can. It's to the point where I've try and cut back to two tattoos a day. Something earlier in the day when we first opened, uh, try and make, get it so that I can kind of get a break around four or five o'clock. So if I need to run over to the school for something or just to call them and see them how their day was doing and, and check on the homework and the whole nine. Um, financially, it's, it's hurt me, but this year was, was the first, you know, since I've started that, it was the first year my son made honor roll. So. I honestly definitely want to reunite my family. Um, it's been part of the process, has, has been, uh, it's been a learning experience. Uh, I guess if I had a, the chance to do it again, um, I definitely would have cut back on on a lot of the tattoo side of it. Um, I love I love what I do, but I also love my children. I love my family. There are a lot of things that I regret. Definitely a lot of a lot of decisions I regret. Um, there's nothing I can do to change the past. It's just pretty much from, from here. Um, who doesn't want their family?
As far as commercialization and um, being on TV and um, having tattooing go from a street shop, biker, gang type situation up to being in Universal, you know, $30,000 a month rent, you know, merchandising on shot glasses and shoes. Hart and Huntington have shoes and stuff now, you know what I mean? I don't wear them, but, you know, um, I think I feel that, I, well, I guess that makes me feel good. And the reason I say that is because being an artist and always I've been an artist, you know, I've always been terrified of the starting, starving artist thing, you know what I mean? You have to have a somewhat of a transition over into the area where they got the money, you see what I'm saying? Um, some people call it selling out, some people call it whatever, you know. The kid that gets straight A's, don't get no pussy. And in tattooing, the person who gets published the most and wins all the awards and makes the most money, gets the most shit talked about them. Now wait a second, how does that make sense exactly? Like I'm doing what you do, I'm climbing to the top of a mountain of a sea of freaks, planting a flag saying, hey, check it out, I kicked some ass. You wanna come get a good tattoo and know it's gonna be good? You're safe here. And all of a sudden, I'm a douchebag? Like, wait a second. Notoriously, tattoo artists bitch and cry and moan and wheeze about these damn TV shows. And how in the hell, Maya, does someone color themselves up like this, get some weird hairdo and some strange clothing, and walk around and get mad because someone's looking at that guy? You know what I mean? They're mad because this person's on TV. Clearly, we all just are jealous. Like, we all want to be noticed. We all want to be weird, but we want to be noticed and appreciated. We want people to say, that weird is good. When I first got into the tattoo show, a lot of cats was like, oh, I can't believe you tattoo in a casino. I can't, ta I can't believe you've worked for some dude that don't, not even a tattoo artist, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know what? Um, I feel that working at this casino is going to bring me more walking traffic, which is going to bring me more money, which is going to afford me to buy more art supplies. And it's also going to get my name out there a little bit more. So instead of doing 15 different conventions a year, I can sit here and people are going to know who the hell I am. I never had money until now. So my whole career, I was living on ramen noodles and fucking strippers and hoping they could knock that rent out because I wasn't making it. And the honest truth is, as I spent all those years doing walk-ins and seeing older artists that didn't have a retirement plan, seeing the future of what we were looking forward to, talking to Zeke about his, like all these things weighed very heavily on my mind and affected my plan, affected my course of action to the point where I didn't want that for my family and I didn't want that for our artists. I don't want to live for this and then end up with nothing. When I see all the merchandising and we're right there smack in corporate America, all right, that's good for you. So I feel that this corporate entity being Hart and Huntington is allowing other artists to make more money. Years ago, the minimums were 50 bucks. Now you got $150, $250 shop minimums because people are becoming aware that, hey man, tattooing ain't cheap, dog. This ain't nothing you just get at your kitchen table. I don't want to rent an apartment when I'm 60 years old. I'd like to live in my own fucking house, thank you, you know? And in tattooing, black or white, it doesn't matter. Like, it's impossible to achieve that unless you actually go outside the box a little bit, unless you actually do color outside the lines. You have to break some fucking rules to accomplish anything. It's still new to, for somebody to say, to be heavily tattooed and black to say, yes, I own a tattoo shop. I tell people that they go, oh yeah, you own a tattoo shop? How long have you owned a tattoo shop? You know, or where's your tattoo shop at? Is, one dude asked me, he said, you own a tattoo shop? He's like, yeah, is it a reputable business? Ask me that. Flat out, is it a reputable business? Yeah, it's, give me my card back. A reputable business. What I'm gonna tell you, no. Fuck out of here. 
No, it's not a reputable business. It's, it's just, <laughs> we sell fucking weed out the back door. It's a million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to see better for my black artists. You know what I'm saying? I want us to, to have the same, you know, rights and as the, as the white artists in this industry. You know what I'm saying? They they can charge X amount of dollars. They can go wherever they want to any shop in the world. You know what I'm saying? I want the same for my people. You know what I'm saying? I want it to be a unified act too because it's not really it's not really white artists that's keeping us down. It's us. You know what I'm saying? It's us that that rather stay at home and, and think they're getting over by staying at home making all the money, or you know the people that don't want to you know, move their self forward in the tattooing industry. They just want to keep, you know, doing little knick-knack tattooing without the, the artistry, you know what I mean? That's, that's what it is. When people really think it's the white artists keeping us down, it's not, it's not them, it's the black artists, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they need to respect that. really love this, then pursue it every corner of the earth because it doesn't necessarily just exist on the block or in the area that you tattoo. Because if you don't go out and see something else and learn something else, then you just dumb fuck with a tattoo machine in your hand. You gotta always have a gun on your hip. I'm here with the legendary Jose Lopez, man. One of my favorite tattoo artists on the planet Earth, man. I, I, I'm about to start working right now, and uh, I just got surprised with my boy here. You know, I mean, I didn't expect him to show up, but I mean, I'm glad that he did. Thank you, man. Just know the oral history of what electric tattooing means. To anybody, you should know if you're gonna be in this business. Even if it's to like knowing who Jackie is, who Ed Hardy is. Because if, if, if you don't know who Ed Hardy is, and he's not a clothing designer, um, you wouldn't be doing cherry blossoms or little wind bars or anything like that. That influenced people to create their own style of wind bars. But the influence came from Ed Hardy because he went to Japan and was the first American to uh, allowed to do that. If I die today, um, as far as the world knowing Imani Brown for something, I would want them to know me for me. Simply put, it's nothing, no science to it, just me, um, outgoing, um, mostly positive, mostly honest, mostly smiling, um, mostly kiddish. So, you know, the simple things, like I don't want anybody to have to or feel like they need to remember anything big or you know just the simple things if something simple that somebody remembers makes somebody smile that's good enough for me today I want to be known for anytime you see this nigga Gino he was strong man, he's a strong ass nigga man that's all it's every time man you know how you see like you know Marion and Chris Brown they just you talking to them and they just dancing you know it's silly niggas you know I just want to be one you know every time I see this wild nigga Gino he's a wild nigga loose an artist tattooing I think uh, I would want to be known as uh, just that cool motherfucker that had a that had a good gift that he shared with as many people as he could. Uh, 
I would like to be remembered as a man who was crazy enough to believe that anything was possible. Because I do. Because everything I've done, so many people have said, you can't do that. And to me, that didn't even make sense to the point where I, I didn't even hear them. So, yeah, I would want to be known as that guy that was kind of crazy. And he, he could do anything because he was nuts enough to believe he could. What I would like to see is people to have an appreciation for something that's going to be on their body for life. You know, I think that uh, that is the problem that we have difficulty making people understand that uh, you just can't uh, take this off a week from now or two weeks from now. It's not about the price. It's about the, the quality. It's something you can live with for, for life. Okay. My name is Zulu. I'm the owner and operator of Zulu Tattoo. Zulu Tattoo has been around for approximately 20 years. You ready? Mm -hmm. Yo, my name is Twig, Twig Sparks, aka Knowledge from uh, the Land 216. You ready? Yeah. All right, I'm Tuki Carter. We in Amsterdam. Out here by some dock, I guess. I'm a graffiti artist, you know, and extended all the way to like just illustrations, you know, I was just like a hobby of just drawing and sketching out things and you know what I'm saying, expressing myself. You know, then I moved to <laughs> cut. <laughs> hey y'all, I'm Sophie Selavi. I am a tattoo artist and a fashion stylist and an artist and a whole bunch of other things. My name's uh, Randall Crowley. Everybody calls me Seven or known as Seven. My name is Maria Chang. I'm apprenticing under Seven Crowley at Studio Seven Design in Cincinnati, Ohio. This is uh, Ryan Henry, a Chicago-based tattoo artist. Uh, been tattooing for two years now. How you doing? My name is Shannon Anderson. I go by Mo Better. I'm oldest of Seven. I got two brothers that actually tattoo with me, go by Glory and Red the Arsonist. My name's James Spooner. I'm a, a tattooer in Los Angeles, California. Um, probably best known for my uh, directing work in the, with the film Afropunk. You already know, my name is Darren. Darren Joseph, everybody call me D. My name is V, working here at Illustrated Inn. My mom boy is Gino, Alex, Darren. All right, are you rolling? We got, we got it. All right, all right. Um, uh. my name's Alexander Campbell. I'm uh, 26 years old. Started tattooing six years, six years ago. Well, my name is Chris Mensa. I'm a 35 year old tattoo artist, born and raised here, Washington D.C. Into the camera, well, into the camera. Oh, okay. or... All right, name is Richard Parker. The streets I'm known as May Rich. Um, <laughs> ah, right between the eyes. You know you on camera. Am I really? <laughs> ah, my name is Derek Christopher Verley. Christopher, show it. <laughs> my name is Damon Conklin, a uh, proud owner of Super Genius Tattoo. People are walking away with this and taking it to the grave, you know? It's like a dirty little secret or something. Uh, my name is Kirkland Butte. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the Red Stick, down here in Louisiana. The name of the shop is F and Body Works. That's how we were taught. That's how we were discovered through our art, you know? My first tattoo I got when I was like 16. Just because my parents were like, you get a tattoo, we're gonna kick you out. My name is Jiggy. Jiggy the Minutes. It makes it a lot easier to explain to people you have that or this. <laughs> my name is Courtney. Everybody called me Cole Young since growing up. I started tattooing in 2003. I'm AC, I'm a Detroit tattoo artist. I tattoo out of body candy tattoos. My name is Lady L, and I am an illustrator and a tattoo artist. I'm co-owner of Untitable Take, which is an art studio and an art gallery. My name 
name is Anthony Locke. I'm the owner of Ink Slingers Tattoo and Art Gallery here in Riverdale, Georgia. I was robbed of the title of token white guy because apparently they brought in other white guys. <laughs> and my name is uh, Duel. My real name is uh, Christopher Hall. I'm from Watts, California. Yeah, I'm going to this thing. Action. What is that called? Call? The thing. A what? Slate. Slate, yeah. Uh, what a hose at? <laughs> 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 My name's Maya Bailey. I'm a tattoo artist in Atlanta, Georgia. But today I'm in Athens, North Carolina, my hometown. I'm Phil Colvin. I've been tattooing in Atlanta for over 20 years on a memorial tattoo. Uh, started out in Phoenix, Arizona, and moved here back in 92. I'm Q-Lock, Q-Lock Nimmons Jr. Gotta say the junior, because my father has the same name and my son. Um, I'm a tattoo artist. Fella. Yeah. Ricky Castillo. I own Inca's Republic out here in Morrow, Georgia. I got a staff of two right now. Um, my boy Chato, my boy Turkey. My name is Russ Abbott. I'm from Eakin Dagger Tattoo in Decatur, Georgia. Yo, you know I'm a private dude. I don't like people in my shit. I'm trying to get personal. Uh, mic check. One, two, three. All right, to the start. Certain people, you know what's a good thing is when, uh, You'll see somebody you haven't seen in 20 years and they got that tattoo and that tattoo's looking good. That's what's a good thing. You know? As I said to you before, I mean, everywhere in the world, do you hear what I'm saying? Everywhere in the world, people are, hey, Jackie, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you be like, what are you doing here? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So that's pretty, that's a lot of fun. You know? Anything else? No, no. That's good. All right, that's it. All right, we done asking your questions. Thank God. <laughs> you did beautiful. <laughs>